are live on Facebook. Welcome everybody to the Not Your Average Investor Show today. I am Pablo Gonzalez, your host. With me as always is my incredible co-host, Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. What's up, everybody? Good to be here. And today we have a revered guest that we are very much looking forward to here. He is one of the foremost real estate investors and educators in the world. His companies have been involved with over a billion dollars worth of real estate transactions, having acquired just $300 million in the last two years alone. He is also one of the foremost educators in the world, having taught thousands of real estate investors how to get in the game, how to make money, including my co-host and JWB themselves. He's basically, some people would describe him as a better looking, more athletic Robert Kiyosaki. So <laughs> if, you will, if you will help me welcome Than Merrill. Welcome, Than. That's uh, that, I've never been introduced that way, Pablo. So I appreciate the the compliment. <laughs> just just call it how I see it, man. Just call that, it how I see it. You know? That's great, Pablo. That is a big microphone, so much bigger than my microphone. I have this little tiny microphone, and uh... <laughs> instead I have a really small head, Dan. It's not the microphone is just playing tricks on you, man. So just so you know, I have I have a little bit of opening housekeeping uh, that 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 I gotta get into, and then we're gonna get right into Than's story. Uh, for those of us that have joined us before, welcome back. We love having you here. We do this every Tuesday and every Thursday at 1230 with Greg. We have guests. We have Q&As. Um, we're going to get to most of the Q&A on the second half of this interview. Uh, but for right now, you should know that we want you interacting with us. We're keeping track of all the questions. If you want to interact with each other, hit the drop down menu button on the chat and go from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. And if you want to ask us questions to be asked live on the air, you go to that Q&A section and you type it in. And we track everything. We follow up with you. Um, if we don't answer it, I'll have people reach out. Also, if you, this is your first time with us, you want to learn a little bit more about rental income property investing with JWB, we have a webinar online at jwbwebclass.com where you find out all the um the pillars of this and, and why JWB does what they do and how they do it and how it fits into your portfolio. And if you have a specific question, you want to get on the phone with our team to see how this fits into your portfolio, go to chatwithjwb.com. It's a super easy calendar link. You pick out the time to do it and the day to do it. And it'll be a very informative. The first call is always just a fact finding informational session to figure out how this fits in for you. So without further ado, I want to welcome you again, Than. And Than, I, I want to dive into, for those of you that don't know who you are, um, and to be honest with you, right, like I've just started getting familiar with you over the last couple of weeks getting ready for this interview, but I'd love to hear a little bit of your story. I know that you're a Yale educated, played football, got drafted into the NFL, had a couple business ventures before you got into real estate. Can you give us like a, a, a quick origin story of, uh, of Than Merrill? Yeah. Um, you know, like many listeners, um, everyone has a journey, everyone has a story. And uh, real estate for me was was really a saving grace. My very first business investment was a Mexican grill. That's what all uh, intelligent ex NFL players do is they invest their money in a, in a Mexican grill. And uh, it was it was a very hard business lesson. I was very young, uh, very naive. Um, I was at the time overconfident about my business knowledge or what I thought I had. And I, I realized that I came to the big realization that I had a traditional education, but I didn't have a financial education. And I had started this Mexican grill and I was working uh, after I ended up getting uh, uh, hurt and cut from the NFL. I ended up going back to this restaurant and working 60, 70 hour weeks. And first of all, I realized um, it was a very tough industry. And I realized just that I, I didn't have a business education. I didn't have a financial education. I didn't have the management skills. I, I was a political science major. And, and I realized I was completely unprepared for the, the business world. And I think I was overconfident because when you're, when you're successful in, in, in athletics in, in some way, it leads to uh, I, what I believe a little bit of a false confidence. And uh, I was humbled by that restaurant. And uh, it was during that period of time that I started looking around and looking at, well, what have the, the, mo the wealthiest, most successful people historically done? How have, how have they built wealth and, and what have they done for themselves? And over and over again, it was buying and holding long-term real estate. It was, it was uh, uh, what the, if, you looked at the, if you look at the wealthiest Fortune 400 wealthiest individuals, 
there's such a common thread. People either started a business and they sold the business. And when they sold the business, they invested in real estate assets. The majority of people who are the wealthiest people throughout, uh, throughout time have historically invested in real estate. It's either been a small part of their portfolio or a significant part of their portfolio. So as I started studying real estate, I realized, you know, real estate's both a business and an investment. And I didn't know that at first I thought it was, it was more just an investment. This is where people invest their wealth, but I didn't realize that you could create a significant amount of wealth in real estate uh, as well, that eventually you would learn to invest. So to me, it just made sense. Gosh, instead of trying to start a business in something else, or why don't I just learn how to uh, uh, buy and develop real estate and at the same time buy and hold real estate because the, I, I just have to learn one thing. I have to be in one industry the rest of my career. And it checked all the other boxes. You know, I could work with my friends. I could uh, uh, determine my own schedule. And so all of those things that we all want in life, real estate, it checked every single box. Now, I didn't know if I was going to love it. I didn't know if I was going to be successful in it. But I realized that it had a tremendous potential. And there was more fish in that barrel than any other asset class and any other investment vehicle and I felt like, you know, it's, it's going to take a, there's going to be a tremendous learning curve, but it's not like I have to go, uh, you know, to be a top surgeon, you go to school for 13 years. I said, you know, I, I think if I invest in my education for a couple years and really learn the craft, I think I could do very well with this financially. And so we started out on that venture and, and 15 years later, I can tell you it was the best decision, you know, I've ever made and the relationships that I've developed along the way with people like Greg and other investors I've cherished. And uh, so that's, that's a short uh, synopsis of 15 years in, in a nutshell. All right, cool. Um, let's dig into that then. All right, so you lived, you lived the life of the people that are coming into this game, the people that you're educating, right? Like you've, you've walked that journey. Um, and then you've also, you sit in a really unique position, right? Like you have all these data points of people mm -hmm. that have entered this journey. And then there's some people that end up like Greg Cohen, there's some people that don't do this a couple years later. Um, what do you th see as the best path of someone getting into this today, right? If somebody wants to build long-term wealth, they want to have a business that does this. What, what is the, what have you, what do you recommend the path to be? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. Um, I'll use Greg. I'll use Greg as an example. I think he's done a lot of great things in his career and, and, you know, looking at Greg, well, it's a great question because why do some people have tremendous success? Why do other people have moderate levels of success? And why do some people get in, in and out of the industry very quickly? Uh, the first thing is, is building that foundational educational base. I think people underestimate the amount of education that it takes to be successful as a real estate investor. I mean, you're, you're playing with hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of capital, whether that's your money or whether you borrowed that money from somebody else. And I think uh, there's a lot, you know, we, were, we had a TV show for a period of time where a lot of people see it on TV and it, it seems easier than it is. You know, it seems in an hour long or a half hour episode, you can see the transformation of a, a property that is flipped. There's hundreds and hundreds of decisions and data points that go into making something successful when you're buying, fixing and selling a property. And so I think the most important thing is, is, is have a love for learning. If you have a love for learning, Greg's a great example of that. Greg's an educational junkie. I'm an educational junkie. I'm always wanting to learn from other people. And you can always learn from people that, that uh, uh, from all different walks of life. But I think you have to realize that it's not, you know, just a weekend course. It's not just five courses and all of a sudden it's really switching your brain to, hey, I'm going to be a lifelong student and I'm going to consistently educate myself in the industry. I'm going to take a passion and curiosity in the industry and I'm going to, I'm going to turn myself into a lifelong learner. And when you make that transition, that's a big first step. Um, I think if you look at somebody like Greg and Greg was always curious and is curious. He's always curious. He's looking at his competition in the industry. What, what, are they, what are they doing in Jacksonville? Could we be adapting some of those ideas to our business model? How are they getting their leads? How is their team structured? What, what software system do they use? What, how do they market? Uh, what's working for them? What's, what's not? And that curiosity, that, that consistent curiosity of asking questions 
is, uh, um, I think, a, a skill that you develop. You know, for example, you can walk into a Chipotle. I like using this example because uh, I own a Mexican grill and Chipotle did it right and I did it wrong. So, but, uh, you know, you, you, ha you have a three minute experience at Chipotle where you can walk in and you can order and you can get your burrito and you can leave. Or you could walk in and strike up a conversation and learn something in those three minutes. So Pablo, you might walk in and say, hey, hey, John, how long have you been working here? You know, uh, uh, before you started working, how long did they train you before you actually got out here? How many customers did you guys serve today? Right? What, what's people's most common? What, what do people like the best? And so you're learning as you're ordering and you walked out of there with some business intelligence. That's that's a shift in, in, in the way you, you operate as a person. And that curiosity my, it annoys the crap out of my wife because we'll, we'll have these interactions with sales clerks. What's your commission structure? How, how, how does it work? How were you trained? And my wife's like, why are you asking all these questions? And it's, it's just a curiosity. I'm learning as I'm buying a shirt at the Gap. And so I think that, that evolution of becoming a, a lifelong student is something that will make you very successful as a real estate investor because you'll just learn more than other investors and that's a competitive advantage. So long-winded answer to, to, to your original question, but I think those two things are building that foundation and having a curiosity to always be learning is, is key. Uh, it's a very long-winded answer, Than You might want to just keep it short going forward here. No, I'm joking, man. That's great. And I, I just wanted to mention that it's like the memorial of your, uh, of your, of your uh, glorified taco stand. Can I call it? It is Taco Tuesday, by the way. So there I mean, you go. This is the <laughs> this is memorial. Uh, no, I mean you're right. And you know, I feel like I'm. I've learned so much from you. You are the first person that I modeled this career after. In you know. It's funny, even when we go into conferences together, I don't know if like when you have a mentor, you automatically like develop their features, but sometimes people actually mistake me for you when I'm walking down, which is pretty, pretty uncanny. And I'll take that as a compliment. So, but you know, when I was starting, I had you and I had, I had Dan, Paul, Conrad, I had the team there to model this. And one of the things I've always just been so impressed with is that, you know, you started this without that type of experience you didn't have all the training that you guys offer through fortune builders now i mean and i look back at my success and it's a large credit to to you and and the people that came before me so i mean when you guys were starting this thing i know for my business partners it was fun and exciting and i felt like we could take on the world but i had a roadmap when you guys were starting this what what were the conversations like and you know were there people maybe not in real estate or maybe you know in real estate that you guys modeled after uh to, to lead you down that path um, we, we, we were, we're junkies, still are junkies. We've been to, we went to so many different conferences, read so many different books. Uh, we started taking some very basic online classes. I, I took classes, uh, in the evenings. I, I went down to NYU, uh, uh, to take some real estate classes from their graduate program, not to get a degree, but just to learn. And so I would take the Metro North from, San, or from not some, San Diego is where I live now, from New Haven, Connecticut, where we started. That'd be quite down a trip to, if you took it yeah, to That would have been a long trip. <laughs> that would have been I'll a really good ways class. In the snow, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, but, and, and so we, we pieced it together. And, and that process, I will say, works for a very small percentage of people. I think following a program, you know, whether it's with us or somebody else, is it, so advantageous because it can just speed up the learning curve. And um, so the, the key, though, is just consistently setting that educational plan. One of the things that we did is we sat down. I had two partners and I said, hey, if, if we're, if we're going to do this, we have to all be learning. You know, so what, what books are you reading this week? What classes are you taking? And there was some accountability there because I wanted them to grow at the same level that I was growing and vice versa. If I was lagging behind, I wanted wanted them to call me out for, for not uh, moving the needle forward. And so that, that level of accountability really helped us and is something, having, having an accountability partner of some, and that's what a coaching program or uh, educational programs really, there's a tremendous value in that accountability and in that peer pressure of being involved in a group where other people are succeeding and you're seeing what they're doing. And so, you know, I'm a big proponent of masterminds of, of uh, uh, classes uh, of coaching simply it works it worked for us it's worked for many of our students and uh, 
you know, I think uh, th that's one of the keys. And, you know, I, I see a, a similarity between JWB and, and what you've done in the sense that you picked out a partner to start with that it was an old friend, right? Like you started with a, a buddy from high school and a buddy from college, right? Yeah. And Greg started with his best friend also. It, can, you, can you speak a little bit to picking the right partner and, yeah. and, and what to think of through that when you're getting into this journey? That's a good question. So, so a partnership, I'm, I'm never going to encourage or discourage a partnership. A partnership is, can be the best decision you've ever made. It could be the worst decision you've ever made. And so I think being slow to pick a partner is the, mo the wisest advice. I think most people that get into a bad partnership have been quick to partner and they haven't thought about all the scenarios that could unfold all the situations so we have a lot of students who have successful partnerships we've had students who have had failed partnerships we have students who have never partnered and so like you said i've had a bird's eye view of what's worked and what hasn't worked so i'll give you a couple of things if you want to write this down if you're following along um, the more partners you have the lower probability of success you have so just adding a partner, I think, actually decreases your probability of success long term. However, if you pick the right partner, it can significantly enhance the quality of your life and could be a great business decision, but there is a risk associated with it. So I always tell people starting out, don't partner to start. Most people partner out of fear. I partnered out of fear. I didn't know what I was doing in real estate. So I looked for somebody else who didn't know what they were doing in real estate, which is my good friend, because I just felt like it would be safer together. And, and, and uh, I wouldn't be standing there naked if I failed. He'd be standing there naked with me if we failed. And so that was a fear-based decision. And now it worked for us, but I'll be frank, it doesn't work for most people when you partner out of fear. I think you have to really look long and hard about the skills of your partner. So that's the next thing I'll address in the question is, okay, if you do want to partner, who should you partner with? So first of all, I would never partner with somebody just because they have contract, contracting experience or because they're a real estate agent. Those, uh, you can hire a great real estate agent. You can hire the best one in the area. You can hire great contractors. You don't need to partner with them. So I see a lot of people say, well, gosh, I lack that knowledge in that area. So I'm going to partner with somebody who's a contractor because they know what they're doing. Well, you can hire a great contractor. You don't have to give up 50% of your company or 40% or 30%. Same thing with an agent. You know, you can hire a great agent at 6%. Um, so just because they have a knowledge of the industry in some capacity does not mean that you can't go acquire that knowledge because you'd be much better off keeping 100% of your equity and uh, going and getting educated. And what I've realized is that the more educated investor gets, the less likely they are to partner. So why has it worked for Greg? Why has it worked for myself? Um, it's because we partnered with people who have one, uh, a, a tremendous, you know, I had a, a, a lifelong relationship since junior high with one of my business partners. So that, that foundational trust and experience. I knew if we were going to fail, we were still going to be friends. I knew if we were going to succeed, we were obviously going to still be friends. I, we had that trust that had been built over years. And same thing with my other partner that uh, I met in college. We had a long, you know, good history of many years of knowing each other. So that was advantageous. So that, that really helped. Uh, we were all the same age. That definitely helps. I see people, you know, none of us had kids at the time. We all had the same uh, level of work ethic and same time commitment. So those things were all um, looking back reasons why we succeeded. I think the most important thing though is skill sets. Like if, if you're looking for a partner, look for somebody who has skill sets that you don't have. Maybe you're really a really good communicator. Maybe you're going to naturally gravitate towards meeting agents and, and, and meeting sellers and doing the acquisition side and, and, you, and, and you love working with buyers, but maybe you're not great with technology or maybe you're not great with, with systems development or the deep, maybe you're not as a detailed orientated a person. So find somebody who has skill sets that enhance. So one plus one should equal three in the partnership. If you take two people that you know, are both very technical, but both afraid to get on the phone, that's not going to work. 
Um, if you take both people that are really good at talking to agents and sellers, but not detail oriented, that's going to be a messy business. And so those skill sets, I think, should complement each other. And uh, it, that's critical to partnering. And so those are all decisions to make. And then the best advice I can give, I'll wrap it with this, would be do one or two deals, three or four deals first without thinking long-term. Let's just, because you can partner on a deal, but not get into a long-term partnership. That's what's great about real estate is you can test the wheel, the, you know, the, the, the viability of this relationship by doing it on one deal, but not having plans to partner long-term. So I tell all our students, do three or four deals together, then make a determination, okay, let's partner long-term. So those are all things to weigh when you're looking at uh, a partnership decision. And, you know, you said one thing that really, we were talking about the number of partners that you have actually decreasing your chances of success. I agree completely. And, you know, I have three other business partners, four of us. And people yeah. are always asking, you know, how do you run a company for 15 years with four guys making the decision or ladies making the decision? Yeah. Like, how does, that, how does that work? So I wanted to peel back the curtain for you guys. When, when there's a really tough decision that needs to be made in your company with your partnership, what's your communication style? How do you got, what have you learned over the years that, you know, makes it successful 15 years down the road? Yeah, what, one of the things we figured out very quickly, it took us six months to figure out, I should say very quickly. Uh, you have to have the ability to make decisions in your area of the business. So we did, we looked at the real estate business and at that time, all we were doing was fixing and flipping properties and then occasionally buying a rental. That's, that was our business model. Um, and so we said, okay, there's, there's different divisions and, and different steps in this transaction. So I have to have total control of the dis ability to make the decision up until this step of the transaction. So if it was acquisition related, or marketing related, I was the CEO of that particular decision. If it was project management and a construction decision, Paul was CEO and he, his, his decision was the final decision. And so we had to make that uh, arrangement. And we, the good thing is neither of us made perfect decisions, but we learned from those bad decisions. And had we second guessed and had we had to have a committee for everything, it would have been too slow. It wouldn't have worked. There were a couple of things that we would have to have a unanimous decision on. Uh, for example, we, we, in essence, we didn't know we had it, but we had what we call an investment committee. So the final decision to buy a deal or not, we both had to decide and say yes to move forward. But every other little decision up until that point, I would make. And then once we were in contract and then doing construction, he would make. And so uh, you have to have you know, uh, uh, an operational procedure where somebody can make their own decisions. And I think that's the best way because being a good business owner is, is being able to learn and make good decisions the majority of the time. And the only way to do that is to make bad decisions and good decisions and learn from those decisions. Makes a lot of sense. I want to just tell everybody right now that we're going to go a little long, right? We're going to add more user generated questions. I got a couple more for you myself also, Than. Yeah. Um, but I, I just want to say for the people that saw the calendar invite, saw that it's only half an hour, you're going to pop off. If you have any questions that you want to ask in the future or anything like that, put it into the, uh, the question box and we'll get to them by the end of the show. I'll and make my answer shorter, Pablo. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I, didn't know, right, I didn't know we were live and I didn't know we were on a half hour time blog. Now I know I'm ready. You're good. We, we just, JWB likes to under promise over deliver, right? So we put in a half an hour, but we usually go about an hour. So it's okay. But just in case anybody's got to pop off, I just want to remind anybody that if they want to find out more about JWB and the fundamentals of all of this, go to jwbwebclass.com. If they want to hop on with our team, talk specifically about questions that may pertain to you, how it fits into your portfolio, things of that sort, go to chatwithjwb.com and schedule a call. And I want to invite people that are joining us for the first time. If you haven't heard of it, we got this Facebook group and we call it our little cool club. It's the JWB rental income uh, investing uh, Facebook group, but you can find it by going to jwbfacebookgroup.com and join us, right? We interact there throughout the week and we have awesome interactions. Uh, but anyways, then I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about early days of when you first met Greg, you first met Alex, 
uh, and you saw them as little puppies without their eyes open yet. And, you know, what, what you saw in them that, that made you want to invest into them and kind of what you've seen work and, and, and how that relationship's grown. Yeah. I mean, I, I've cherished the relationship since the day I met Greg and Alex, because they're, they're just good guys. They're, they're fun to be around. Uh, they make life more enjoyable. Every conversation that we've had is, has always been, uh, there's always been laughter. There's always been a mutual respect and appreciation. And, and what I saw in Greg and Alex very early on is, is you know, we were just a, a couple of years ahead of them just because we're older. And uh, we had been down that path that they, had, that they were wanting to go down. And so when they were looking for assistance and help, I said, you know, I, I know we can help these guys. We've done a lot of things right. We've made a lot of mistakes. And I could just tell they were both um, very driven, um, asked a lot of questions, and extremely motivated. And those those skill sets remain today. And, and that's why we've had a great business relationship, you know, started out as a mentor mentee relationship, but has really developed into a peer relationship where, um, you know, we now invest with them. We now have properties that they manage for us. Uh, we entrust them. We refer a lot of our clients to, to them and they've done a great job. I mean, managing rental properties is not an easy business. And I don't think everyone can have an appreciation for, how hard it is unless you've managed a portfolio of your own rentals. Then you, then you, that's when you really have perspective. And I, I kid and, and joke about it, but we, we started out self-managing our properties and um, we, we acquired quite a few rentals and my gosh, it's a beast. I mean, it's a beast to manage your own rentals. And when we, and when you really make a business out of it, like JWB and like Greg and Alex and, and the team has, they've done a wonderful job. It's not a perfect business by any means. You're going to have tenants that leave, but it's, uh, it's been amazing to watch their growth. Um, I'm very proud of what they've, what they've done. And I've also, you know, invested a lot of money with them personally. And I have loved uh, the results and just love the care they take at, at running their business, the care they, they have for their team, which is then reflected by how the tenants are managed. And, I think the true appreciation is whenever, you know, somebody has not an issue with JWB per se, but an issue with prop managing their own portfolio of rentals or a property manager outside of JWB, I always say, once you've managed your own rentals, you'll have a real appreciation for what JWB does and, and uh, the, the decisions they make. They've done a, they've done a wonderful job and I, I have only the highest respects for what they've done. And I, I was uh, in anticipation of this, I was rehashing some of our, our old good stories of the good old days. And uh, I wanted to just take a trip down memory lane with you, brother. Do you remember the first time that you came to Jacksonville? And I uh, sure do, I, man. You guys, you guys were, it was like the Ritz Carlton experience. You <laughs> Why don't up. you tell everybody about this budding superstar in real estate, former NFL star, and how I, how I put you up and set you up for success. You rolled off the red carpet. So I, I had a, a, a conference or a educational group I was going to speak at, and I got invited. It was in Jacksonville. I said, oh, well, I'm going to call Greg and Alex, and I'm sure they're going to roll out the red carpet. I'm, they probably have a guest house at their humble abode, and, you know, it'll probably be on a lake. And, and I envisioned, you know, just like breakfast in bed from – from from their butler we were we well, were 24 at this time by the way we were out of college for like a year by the way so, so the reality what actually happened is when we showed up at their house i said man well okay this is this is, i'm gonna where am i gonna be sleeping you know i'm in the guest bedroom or where you put up grandma or your mom and no well we don't really have a guest bedroom because there's three of us taking up all three bedrooms and so they pointed to the floor in a sleeping bag and that's exactly <laughs> what I had better accommodations in my, in my freshman dorm room than I did in, uh, uh, secretly, you know, Than had the option to go and book a hotel room, but he is such <laughs> a wannabe frat boy that he just wanted to bunk up. So, and the truth is that it was a tile floor. So I tile. came out, yeah. I came out of my room and I saw Than sleeping in a sleeping bag on the tile floor. We That's had a couch exactly. there, but the couch was so uncomfortable that in the middle of the night, I'm sure you found that the tile floor, was much more hospitable. Uh, well, your, your couch smelled like beer. I didn't want to. I didn't want to <laughs> sleep on it, so I, I picked the tile. Nothing floor. but the best from you, brother. Nothing but the best, man.
<laughs> We've come a long way. We've come a long way. All right. So I'm gonna, I want to start asking some user-generated questions here. Sure. Um, Tayeb K asked, do you believe there are opportunities for someone to start their real estate investing during this state of the world, i.e. the pandemic and what's going on? Or do you recommend for someone who's just, who's starting to just watch? Um, yeah. If there are any opportunities for newbies, you know, what do you, what, what should they watch for while investing during this fragile economy? Yeah. So a couple, I'll give you a couple things. I'll, I'll share with you how we've adapted our business. Uh, you know, in, in, in times where markets are shifting in residential real estate, if you're buying and flipping properties, I think luxury real estate is, is definitely a, a riskier area of the market. So if you're going to be getting into flipping properties, you're going to want to start with median to median price point, workforce housing uh, price points, and shorter construction timelines. That's always gonna be a, a better risk adjusted investment strategy in today's market. Uh, the reality is in today's market, uh, there's going to be some good buying opportunities. Real estate is historically very slow. Um, so we haven't seen a huge shift in the residential market. Um, there will be some distressed opportunities in, in six months, nine months from now there will be great buying opportunities. The reality is, is this though, procrastination in investing never pays off simply because uh, investing in real estate is time and interest rate. So if you're buying rental properties, the, the thing that makes wealth in rental properties is your length of ownership and the interest rate or your return on investment. And so people that are consistently saying, well, I'm going to wait till the market's perfect or the market's better. You're going to be paying a premium for those properties. You're going to have missed out on potentially a year or two years worth of cash flow payments, uh, equity buildup. And so that's working. Procrastination works against investors. So we're absolutely still acquiring single family rentals. We're absolutely still making commercial real estate investments. We just bought a $23 million shopping center uh, from a 1031 exchange from a couple of rental properties we owned for many, many years. And so, uh, there will be opportunities, st strategy shift, timeline shift. Uh, when, when a market changes, you know, I wouldn't get into a three-year development project, probably not a two-year development project. That's going to have more risk than, than I would say is, is, is equitable. Uh, but there's, a significant number of investment strategies you can employ today that will work very well. So we're very active uh, today. Uh, we're a little bit more conservative on what we buy uh, for sure, but we're uh, still very active. Okay, great. That makes a lot of sense. So there, there's a lot of questions around this. So I'm just kind of key in on a couple of different things. Sure. Um, Jim Kirko asked, well, first of all, I'm going to get this out there. He said that you made great burritos in New Haven. He had eaten there a couple <laughs> of times and he got one on the house during one visit. So he was really happy about that. That's why, that's why it was good. Cause it was free. <laughs> <laughs> right. it, it always makes it taste better. Right. Um, so Jim Kirko asks, if you had a million dollars in retirement funds, given the current environment, where would you be investing it? And then he yeah. asked timing, single family rentals, stuff like that. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is, is where, where do you have knowledge? You know, I, making the smartest investments is really going to be based on your education. So if you've been studying the market and single family rentals, that's where I would, I would tend to invest. Uh, I would tend to only invest in things that I have some knowledge of. Um, I think the safest investment is single family rentals. I think it'll historically always be the safest long-term investment because there is, a, there is a shortage across the country. There is no doubt that the cost to construct homes today, that we are supply constricted. And when you are supply constricted, that investment will perform well long-term. Yeah, the, you know, the valuation of a property might go up or down, but long-term with inflation, it's gonna go up. If, if you study economics, and if you study fiscal policy, monetary policy, the government is gonna continue printing money. And that is going to create inflation and that is going to enhance the value of your real estate assets. That's going to enhance your cash flows. If you own a property 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, your cash flows are going to go up because of inflation. Uh, that means your, your, the monthly take home is, is generally going to be the worst year one. It gets better year two, you're better year three, better year four. So if I never had to sell a piece of real estate, I would never sell it. The only reason to sell real estate is to go out and buy more real estate that you're, you know, buy more single family homes or buy more commercial properties that you're going to hold long-term. And so 
Uh, inflation is your friend in owning real estate assets. So which real estate asset is best? Um, I think the lowest risk at every, every investment has risk, but single family rentals, there's always going to be a demand. There isn't always going to be a perfect supply and demand balance for office space in every market around the country, uh, self storage, but people always need a place to live. People are always, last time I, I checked, people are always going to be making babies. They're, the population is going to continue to grow. The cost of construction is so high that we're going to be supply constrained for a very long time, I think. And uh, uh, you see it in major markets around the country. And so I think that's the safest place to park your investments long term. So then you just want to have a great property management company. The, the next best, I would say, is, is apartment communities. Now it's a little different. You have to study a little different business model, have a different acumen, but it's residential real estate. It's very much the same. And then from there, you know, I would look at other uh, real estate asset classes beyond that. So that would be my answer to that question. Yeah, and I just think that there's, there's just not a one size fits all answer. It's part of the beauty of real estate is you can diversify within real estate right? People talk about yep. so much about the benefits of diversification in all asset classes, but in real estate, you can diversify and achieve that diversification by investing in apartment complexes or single family rental properties or commercial office buildings and, and things of that nature. And, you yep. know, and there's, there's a place in most portfolios for a little bit of all of it now. And the way that you can invest and have a little bit of all of that is available to you today wasn't available you know 10 years ago it was a whole lot more difficult to be able to invest in a commercial office building 15 years ago than it is today so to the question of how would i invest a million dollars you know i would first start with what you know best and what you have familiarity with and what you have partnerships to help you be successful and we all know that i'm partial to, to single family rental properties but it wouldn't be all single family rental properties right? Depending on what your goals may be, it may be a, a majority or maybe a minority and there may be, you know, apartment complexes. Maybe you're, maybe you're going to be active. Maybe you've got the time and the energy and you want to get out there and flip a property. Well, that's great. You just got to know why you're getting into it, what your return expectation should be. And, um, you know, and that's how you build a successful portfolio. Great. Great team answer. Greg, I'm glad you chimed in there because we, we, have, we have people clamoring for more Greg. <laughs> <laughs> they want more Greg. More Greg, more cowbell. Yeah, I should buy a nickel for every time I've heard that. I'd be <laughs> poor man. More cowbell, please. More cowbell. <laughs> more cowbell. Um, all right, great. Let's let's keep going here. So Lee Bishop, this seems like a like a quick like a quick answer. Lee Bishop, always great having him on. One of our one of our regulars here. Uh, Than and Paul started uh, Roth IRA and purchased a home together, and it took off. Was that house a BRRR? No, so we, the way we got our, our uh, Roth IRA to grow is we did some wholesale deals very early on. When we first started our Roth, obviously there wasn't, a, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have a lot of capital in that Roth. So we, our first few transactions were wholesale deals. And those um, were great decisions to make because obviously when it goes back into your Roth, you know, what you can contribute each year is capped. But what you make within your Roth is not capped. And so that was a great way to build the account. Then from there, we could go out there and buy other types of investment properties. So, uh, you know, self-directed retirement accounts are so many different types of accounts. You can do a solo 401k, which can be, you know, extremely advantageous, but it's definitely a great wealth building tool. So I love the question because if there's curiosity around great ways to invest your retirement, self-directed Retirement accounts can be a great vehicle for single family rentals. They can be a great vehicle for uh, commercial syndications. They can be a great vehicle for, whole, for wholesaling. Um, there's a, a variety of different investment strategies you can utilize. But anything, anytime you can have money that's tax deferred or tax free, you know, that's only going to help you build wealth that much faster. So great question. Yeah, we talk a decent amount about those. I know Greg's real passionate about um, tax-free wealth creation and, and self-directed IRAs. Going um, to bed at night, that's what I talk about. My wife loves it when I talk about that, you know? Pillow talk. Excited. Hey, honey. <laughs> <Kind of> pillow <laughs> talk. <laughs> hey, honey, you want to hear about my Roth? <laughs> oh, man. Or our Roth. Maybe it's our Roth. I shouldn't Very say true. my Roth. When you were single, it was my Roth. Now it's, What's... Now it's her Roth. It, and it feels so good to share a Roth IRA. I mean, she just <laughs> loves that. I mean, it's like one of the greatest gifts, right? 
<laughs> awesome. Uh, Marilyn Cotterman has a question, which you've answered part of it, but I'm going to dig into a second piece. Are you currently active in buying, selling, and selling and renting properties or just educating people at this time in your career? So it's obvious that you're still active. Yeah, uh, do you want to talk a yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more about the educating side and how that's going and, and, sure. and where we can yeah, find it? Yeah, so we, we have really three core businesses. We have a residential real estate investment company, which is CT Homes. You can look up our website, CT Homes LLC. But uh, so that's where we buy and sell single family properties, mainly fix and flip, mainly residential properties and small multifamily. And then we have a commercial real estate investment company where we buy apartment communities and retail shopping centers. So we have a team of 15 on the residential side, a team of, of eight on the commercial side. And then our educational company um, is investors all throughout the country. So we have people that uh, have been investing for years and people just starting out who become clients of ours and come through educational events and in our coaching programs and uh, learn from our online curriculum. So that's our company fortune builder. So those are our three main companies. And uh, I spend a little bit of time each day in each of them, uh, which makes for great variety. Uh, can also be somewhat distracting at times when you're wearing different hats, but I love it. I love investing and I love helping other entrepreneurs uh, launch successful real estate investment companies. So those are, those are our, our companies and what we do. And that's, that's unique. When somebody reaches the stature that you do, that you have fan with, you know, the thousands of students that you have and, you know, I, you know, I want people to realize that most of those people quickly get out of the actual game of performing real estate transactions, right? Yeah. But you guys have always stayed true to that. It sounds like that wasn't just something that, um, you know, that you did to keep credibility. It's because you really love real estate investing and you thought that that is going to make you much better at the education part as well, yeah. I would imagine, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've always said the day we get out of real estate investing is the day we stop educating because it's disingenuous. You, you can't be teaching strategies that you're not actually utilizing. And I think for some, you know, it gets a, sometimes the industry gets a little bad rap because you have people who become less, you know, they, it's hard to run two businesses. And I'm glad I have partners. Otherwise, I don't think we would have been able to achieve everything we've been able to achieve because it is, you know, you can't, Educating and investing is for one person running multiple businesses can be challenging. So for us, it's nice that we have partners because we can do it, everything. And then we've created systems. So our residential real estate investment business, I don't have to spend a great now. When I started, I spent a lot of time. But when uh, now I don't have to spend a lot of time each week in that business. I still have to spend time. I still have to make, help make decisions and, and drive revenue and make sure that we're not making mistakes. But uh, um, you know, when you have systems in place, you can become a true entrepreneur and grow different verticals, you know, and that's, you guys have done a lot of that. You guys have your own portfolio you manage, but yet you manage for investors. So those are different companies. And, and I know they rely on the same infrastructure, but they're, they're different decisions. They're, they're different things you guys have to make every day. And so it's, uh, it's, it's been fun and I'll continue to do it. I mean, investing in real estate is a lifelong venture. I, 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 would highly doubt that I won't be active till the day I die because, you know, I may not be flipping as many properties, but I'll definitely have rental assets that are producing income that will pass down to my kids. So, you know, it's going to be something that I do forever. You mentioned something that in the research I was doing about you, you normally mention it sooner, right? Systems, right? I know you're a big believer in systems. I look at Greg and I look at JWB and I see that they're big systems people, can you talk about the importance of systems and just where the, where the pain point of understanding that you needed these systems came in and, and how you go about implementing them? Yeah, the pain point came in when I started that Mexican restaurant because we had no systems and I was, work, I, was, I was the first one there. I was the last one to leave. I, I did everything from ordering the supplies to working the cash register to making burritos to cutting the avocados. And if you work with guacamole more than five hours a day, you, you start to realize... I'm probably doing something wrong here. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that, that pain was real and, and that stuck with me. And so when we got into real estate, I said, I'm going to take a much more conservative, slower approach. I'm going to get educated and then I'm going to build systems. And there was a few books I read along the way that, that really shaped my thinking. I read a book called The E-Myth written by Michael Gerber, which is a, the philosophy. It's a story and it's, it's a very well told story about, 
the struggles that most business owners go through when they're working in their business versus on their business. The concept is very easy to understand. And that's when it opened my eyes to, okay, I got to create a systems dependent business. Now that's easier said than done. Sounds good in theory, but you actually have to go out there and do it. So, you know, over the years, it was just, it was tracking our time and, and figuring out, okay, this part of the transaction took us 10 hours. How can we do this part of the transaction in seven hours next time? How can we do it in five hours? Then how can we hire someone to do it in four hours and follow our process and then remove ourselves from that step of the business? And so, you know, there's a very good movie uh, that you can watch called The Founder about Ray Kroc. And it's the whole movie is really about his evolution of building a systems dependent business, a billion dollar company run by people on minimum wage, really. And uh, it's, it's whether you like Ray Kroc or not, you have to have a respect for, for his philosophy of, of creating systems within one of the toughest industries. And that's what JWB's done. That's what we've done. And, and that's, that's the key. A lot of people get into real estate for the financial gain and they realize they love it. You know, they can control their time, but you don't ultimately have time freedom in any business until you, until you have systems that are running the company. So building a systems dependent business is the most important thing in, in, uh, um, in any business. Greg, can you speak to that a little bit too? Yeah. You know, as I'm listening to more and more of this interview, I just think about all the things that we've put into place and, and it all comes back to either seeing fans business. Like for my, for my own eyes, I got to be there day one of the education business. I got to see CT homes in existence in their office. And, and I remember looking through your, your file folder system, you know, and I was like, <laughs> Oh man, like I never thought I needed a system for that. Right. And, and I saw that system. Right. And then going and getting the opportunity to speak with you at all of your conferences and working with all of your, your students, right. Seeing the systems that they've implemented through all the resources that are a part of it now. And, you know, and every, I feel like every conversation me and you have, right. We talk about system is a word that comes up every single conversation we have. Right. Yep. And it's, and it's, it's this, 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 um, it's what becomes scalable, right? Because there's any idea that you have can be a great idea. The ones that become scalable can be life-changing. Right. And so we've tried to adopt everything that you're talking about and we found our own niche. Right. Yeah. And you, once you understand these processes, you read the e-myth, you understand, the, the theory behind it, you can put it into action. It doesn't matter what course of business you're in. Um, you have a really great chance of being successful. So it all comes back to, uh, you know, those good old days of the first boot camp at, at, uh, in New Haven with you. And, um, you know, it just continues to be built upon over the years, man. It's been, it's been a, been a great learning opportunity for sure. And, and what you guys have done so well is the property management side has the most, you know, if you look at checklists for acquisition versus a checklist for property management, you know, the checklist for acquisition is going to be half the size, the checklist of property management. What you guys have really done is, is tough. Building a, a, a single family property management business is very much dependent on systems. That's going to determine the, the quality of experience your clients have, the returns generated, the quality of experience the tenants have. And uh, so it's, you know, that's uh, a lot of respect for what you guys have done in your niche that you guys found and have really built an amazing business around. It's funny when I used to go to a lot of the conferences early on, you know, it was a significant amount of time and, and money to go and go travel across country and follow fortune builders around. And, you know, I was busy building this thing and, and all this good stuff. And so I made sort of a deal with Dan and with Paul and with Conrad. I said, I'm going to go, you're going to get 110% from me. I'm going to be there. But at the same time, I'm going to be watching and I'm going to copy everything you do and I'm going to bring it back to my business. <laughs> and that's what we did, right? And, Smart and it, investors do. Yep. <laughs> it, was a, it was a beautiful thing. I mean, you look at, you know, it, I did a, a walk and talk earlier in our Facebook group and we were talking about what does JWB uh, stand for, right? And over the years, our, the name of our business, you know, early on, we didn't know exactly what we were doing. So we named it one thing, we changed the name. Well, how did we come up with Jacksonville Wealth Builders, which is originally what JWB stood for? It's because I looked at Than's company. I was like, I'm just going to follow what he did, right? Fortune Builders, yeah. right? Jacksonville Wealth Builders. That, that makes sense, right? I mean, I like, I like the name. <laughs> and there's a million other decisions that have been followed in that same, same mentality. But, you know, it all comes back to those systems, man. You find something that's been 
done. That's why I, you know, I was instantly attracted to learning from people like Than. I found people that were at a level that was much greater than where I was. I wanted to get there. And I just simply walked in with humility, asked a bunch of questions. And then I just, I followed the systems that were done. Um, and we all, we all can do that. Awesome. Great feedback. Uh, we got two more questions that I'm going to ask. First, I'm going to give a little bit of love in the comments here. Dustin Rieger puts in, my wife and I joined Fortune Builders in 2012, and it was the best decision we ever made. Education is key. So I thought that that was a nice thing. Awesome. Uh, Ro Roldan Crepo puts in, Greg, once you get your book published, you're going to need to educate so many people, man. He's, he's encouraging you to become an educator. Nice. Um, Team JWB here is coming in with some great, uh, with some great feedback. Katie Derringer puts, "Quote for the ages: If you're working with guacamole more than five hours a day, <laughs> you're doing something wrong." We're making a quote card out of that for sure. Um, Cassandra puts in, "I did my first book report here at JWB on the E-Myth. That's great." Uh, Jane also, Jane Terracano also says it's a great book. And um, what else do we have? Uh, Steel <laughs> Maryland puts, "Steel shamelessly copy and paste great ideas and systems." I can't disagree with that. Uh, all right. So now back to questions. Mike Foster puts in, this is a small question and it's a two-part question that have nothing to do with each other. So I hope you're ready, Than. Uh, wow. 2001 with the Bears. Cool. How was it playing alongside Brian Erlacher? See if you can answer that real quickly. And then his question is on to business. You partner with a long, lifelong friend, as we spoke about before. How have you guys avoided damaging your friendship along the way when your business strategies may have differed? Yeah, great question. So playing with Brian was amazing. Uh, one of the most amazing athletes, Hall of Famer, um, and just a, an amazing, uh, amazing guy as well. Uh, with uh, my business partner, Paul, I think the, the first of all, we, we had a, a long history of friendship, which has helped, you know, we've had many intense discussions, we've had arguments, we've had differing points of view. And, and uh, so, you know, I think uh, the thing that we've done is just communicate, you know, we, we meet once a week, my, this is my daughter. She wants some air time. Too. <laughs> my computer was about to run out of juice. So she had to bring my charger for me. Daughter uh, and assistant. There you go. You got exactly. You got to have a, a, an assistant at home like that. That's amazing. She's underpaid though. I got to say that she's definitely <laughs> underpaid. You're going to have to, you're going to have to. So um, really just the communication that we've had over the years has really been key. We, we sit down and talk once a week. Um, we, we meet on a monthly basis. We take time to get away. Uh, our families are friends. So all of those things have definitely uh, helped the decision-making process and, and the uh, uh, not, not let small decisions get in our way. So that would be a, the answer to that question. And I'll just, I'll add on to that too. I get that question a lot between Alex, myself, uh, my two other business partners who are both named Adam, right? Having a, a four-headed decision-making monster, right? Where multiple people can be CEO at one point in time takes a, a whole lot of skill. What, what we've learned is, is really the art of consensus decision-making. This was a skill that we needed to learn. I think, man, it was probably four or five years ago that we invested in some coaching to learn how to make sure that we could make these high level decisions and do it well uh, to preserve our friendship, to preserve our working relationship and for the health of the of the business and consensus decision making when it's all boiled down means that you know i may think that i have the best and uh, the best answer and when i come to the table and we all share what our best answers are i'm gonna think that mine's the best but if it becomes that that's not the way that we go i have to be humble enough to give my full support behind somebody else's decision and while that sounds simple in principle that's really hard to do. As humans, we think that we're right, especially if we've achieved some level of success. We think that, you know, that, that we tend to be a little bit more stubborn or whatnot. Um, and it's hard for us to fully give our, our energy and our support to something that may not be our own idea. And once my business partners and I figured this out, um, we started to practice it and it was hard in the beginning. Uh, but, you know, five years later, whenever, you know, that, that original kind of aha moment happened, it is the single greatest reason that we're as strong today as ever um, and will continue to be stronger. It's because even though I know that my decision might not be the one that we go with, I'm going to give my heart and soul into, into supporting it. I'm not going to sabotage it. And I know that those three other gentlemen are going to do the same. All right. Yeah. Very, very wise advice. That's why you have the gray hair. 
gray. <laughs> I think I do have more gray hair than you. How did that happen? No, I got a lot. I got a lot. I, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of distinguished gentlemen here. So Stephen Block asks, do, do Than and Greg have investment assets in other classes, such as equities, bonds, whole life insurance, or other? And if so, what? Yeah, so all three of those, I, I have uh, life insurance. Um, I have in, a lot of investments in equities. I have some investments in bonds. Um, real estate is still probably at least 60% of, of my portfolio that I invest in, and 40% would be every, made up of everything else from cash to to, I don't like to keep a lot of cash because you know, you're earning less than 1% in the bank is, is kind of a nightmare uh, scenario. Uh, I get antsy when I have money just sitting there doing nothing or equity in a property doing nothing. So, but I definitely have a diverse, I wouldn't say it's still heavily slanted to real estate. Just that's what I know best, but uh, good question. Yeah. Mine's very heavily slanted towards real estate. I really, uh, subscribe to the theory that you can diversify within real estate, but when, you know, it's been what I've devoted my career to for the last 15 years and I have all these relationships, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to go to something that I have really no knowledge of, uh, or at least in a great scale. So I achieve diversification through things like owning rental properties, private lending. You know, I invest with Than and with fortune builders and their syndications, which allow me to take advantage of commercial real estate. Um, and I do have some money in the stock market. Uh, I don't invest in bonds. I don't really see a way that investing in bonds makes more sense than private lending or rental property investing. So I stay away from there. Um, but I think there's a place for equities, although, you know, I, I try, try to limit it. <laughs> I really, I'm always magnetically drawn to diversifying within real estate because it's what I know, love. And, and I think at the end of the day, it, it does produce better returns, better risk adjusted returns than what you can find elsewhere. Excellent. Great advice. So we've been here for an hour. I don't want to keep you any longer than we need to fan. We want to respect your time. Uh, we have a couple more questions. We'll, we'll get back to you, Jim. We can get back to you on your question about um, new versus rehab, single family homes. Bill, we can get back to you on your question about learning from investments that we lost money. We can follow up with you. But then before we leave, um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to is there any, anywhere to connect with you or something you want to promote or anything like that? Just kind of give you the floor to talk about anything that, that, that you want to promote to this audience. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you can go to our main website, fortunebuilders.com. And one of the things that we're doing, you know, we're not doing live educational events right now, obviously with everything that's going on. Uh, but we are doing some virtual educational events. So if people have an interest in, and have never been introduced, if you're already a coaching student, you know, you're already in the program, this isn't necessarily, uh, something you need to do because you're obviously very involved with our different uh, educational programs and events, but we do some uh, one day trainings for new people who have never experienced what we teach. And I teach those. So you can go to our fortunebuilders.com, our main website and check that out. Great. So go to fortunebuilders.com and check that out. If you want to see it, if you want to learn a little bit about more about how JWB does this stuff, go to jwbwebclass.com and, and, and watch that webinar. That'll be a good use of your time. And if you want to talk to the team of how to fit in passive investing, rental income properties into your portfolio, completely turnkey, uh, go to chatwithjwb.com, pick out a time and date to talk with somebody on our team. And that'll be an informational session for you to really pick our brains and us to get to know you and see if it makes sense for you. So I just, Than, I want to really thank you, man. Than and Greg, both of you, super educational for me. I feel really privileged to have been a fly on the wall in this conversation here and, and, and get to get the knowledge right from the source. So thank you for me. Thank you, everybody that's part of this call. Greg, I'd like to give you the last, uh, the last uh, word. Yeah. You know, Than, it's, it's been great to have you here, buddy. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, I still remember what it was like, that fear that I had jumping into that first conference that I had. And I, I remember going up and talking to you. And I remember the genesis of what was the beginning of our company. And, and it was the genesis of what Fortune Builders teaching um, has become. And I just feel so lucky and blessed that I was there with you. And I feel really lucky and blessed that I have somebody like you to follow. Um, it wasn't just in the beginning. Uh, it's been years and years and years. And I still call you up every once in a while. I'm like, Hey, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about this? You know? Um, and I just really appreciate that. But I think the, the thing that I'm most thankful for is, you know, I know you're like me, 
you know, the, the money is not a big motivator in real estate for, for us, right? It's the relationship. It's the idea that you can have a buddy that you got to know 15 years ago, randomly at a conference. Then he came and slept on your floor like three months <laughs> later, right? And um, you can jump on a conference call like this, you know, 15 years later, and you've been able to do some really great things, but that friendship hasn't changed in 15 yeah. years. And so, you know, I just think friendships like yours and, the, and the, the things that the circumstances that brought it along are, you know, one in a million. And uh, I'm truly appreciative of your friendship, man. It's been a, a great ride. And I know, you know, the, uh, the best is yet to come. So appreciate what uh, I appreciate you, Greg and Alex and the team and Adam and everyone uh, that we've been involved with and loved it. You know, I, I would I would absolutely agree. I think everyone on this on this uh, call or webinar or whatever we're calling this thing. Uh, um, I think what you'll look back on is, is not how much money you made in, in real estate or all the good decisions and bad decisions made along the way, but the people you've helped and the relationship you've created and very much appreciate what you've done. You guys have created an amazing company and for people out there who are looking uh, to invest, I think you're in, in good hands because they're, they're good people at, at their core, everyone at JWB. So thanks for having me. Nice to meet you as well, Pablo, with your big microphone. <laughs> Pleasure was mine, Dan. Thanks, man. See you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.